join the Salady Mania podcast. I'm your co-host Nadine Sue, and thank you for being here for episode three. By my side, I have our sound engineer, Mark Mondoy. And ladies and gents, here is your host, my honey bunny, Benson Sue. Welcome, guys. Hey, Nadine. Yo. <laughs> Did you just honey call bunny. me Nadine? <laughs> honey bunny. We've upgraded from honey buns. I like honey bunny. Okay. You know, it's a very, a very spring theme. Yeah, yeah, it's very professional. That's good. <laughs> it's, it's getting more professional. <laughs> okay. Honey buns. Um, I think we need to start this off by sharing with our audience what you're drinking today, because this is different. Like you're usually drinking something much more innocent. Yeah. But you had some nervous vibes earlier no, I today. Don't, I, I didn't have nervous <laughs> vibes. I think it's, you know, it's any time where like something breaks my schedule, just messes me up. So yeah, I had some anxiety because of like trying to figure out this new schedule for today. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, so today I'm just having some cognac. Oh, just, just, just sipping, some cognac. Sipping some cognac. Just straight up. Yeah, you know, like yeah. at a Chinese banquet, <laughs> bust out the cognac. Yeah, and, and guys, he walked through... My studio, because our podcast studio is at my my photo studio. So he walked through the studio door, holding a whole bottle of this cognac, and like, mind you, like I have employees at the front, and he walks by them. He's like, "Hello," <laughs> he's walking by <laughs> with a bottle of cognac. Thanks, real professional. But anyway, I'm drinking a honey green tea from Nest. Shout out to Nest, my favorite yep. tea house in Arcadia. We, we definitely pay their rent. <laughs> How about you, Mark? What are you drinking? Thai iced tea for me. I love caffeine. Did you hear about the boba shortage? Yeah, if I could have boba made of caffeine, <laughs> oh. like I'd prefer that. Oh, I'm sure there is. Caffeine's in everything. Tapioca, caffeine. Anyway, let's talk about this episode. And this is a different episode than our other episodes that we've had so far. Our forefathers and mothers of drifting aren't always drivers, guys. Today's guest is an individual who's always been behind the scenes, but at the forefront of supporting all our fellow drift drivers from the past to the current day. He was there from the start, and if it wasn't for him, it's possible drifting might have never been considered a real motorsport in the eyes of at least the tire companies. Things just wouldn't be the same without him. Are you guys ready for this official introduction of our guest? Heck yeah. Let's I just, do it. Like, I was born ready. Cut, oh, 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 hey. oh, oh, Mark was born ready now. <laughs> okay. Here we go. Nick Fusekis is from Corona, California, and is married with one daughter, two FDRX7s, and an SW20 MR2. Nick has worked for Falcon Tire USA since 2002. Guys, that's nearly 20 years Nick has moved his way up through the ranks at Falcon from marketing specialist, then six other title changes, to today, where Nick is a director of advertising and promotions at Falcon Tire. If you're a sponsored drift driver, chances are you've been sponsored by Falcon Tire at one time or another and have worked with Nick. Some of us would say that the word Falcon and Nick are interchangeable. Both Benson and I and Drifting Pretty have all been sponsored by Falcon Tires slash Nick. And this leads us to why we have Nick on the show today. And no, it's not because he gives us free tires. When Nick was just hired at Falcon Tires back in 2002, he proposed that they support drifting as a motorsport. And they did. And it was Nick who took a chance meeting with the godfather of the import car show scene. Mainstream Productions import show-offs Ken Miyoshi to launch the Falcon Tire Drift Show-Off in 2003, which was the first American-hosted drifting competition catered to the general public. With a joint effort from Signal Auto, they brought over Yoshinori Koguchi, Seigo Yamamoto, Chunky Bai, and Komatsu to judge the competition and drive exhibitions for us. And coincidentally, it was our dear Benson who won first place at that Drift Show-Off that fateful day in 2003. Over the years, Nick and Falcon have continued to support our growing drifting scene and have remained a sponsor for Formula Drift these past 18 years. Nick has been instrumental in drifting's progress as a motorsport. Without his early and consistent support, I'm not sure drifting would be the same today. Nick, welcome to the show. Oh, that's a hell of a uh, (laughs) intro and build up there. 
I don't know where to go from there. Oh, but thank you. Thank you for having me. It's uh, uh, really great to be on the podcast. I appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you for making the time in your busy schedule, director of advertising and promotions. Jeez, your your title has changed a lot over these years since we first yeah. met you. Yeah, it, it's been a great coming up on 19 years with the company now. And yeah. uh, like you said, you know, just uh, humble beginnings and uh, being at the right place at the right time and, and having an opportunity. And uh, it's been uh, amazing. Yeah. So I'm very thankful. Well, we're thankful to have you today. And, you know, I want to break the ice with you, Nick, because I, you know, I know you're a fellow cartooner like us. What is a dumb thing that you did to your car when you were first starting out? You've got to have something. Oh, <laughs> the dumbest thing that I did with my car uh, was probably about three hours after I got my driver's license. Uh, <laughs> I decided to drag race a, a buddy of mine and uh, I wrapped it around a telephone pole going Ooh. about 70. No. Wow. Yeah. yeah. So that was a, uh, you know. What kind uh, of car was it? It was an 85 Dodge Shelby Charger, you know, the little hatchback oh, turbo wow. things. So I bought the car from an auction when I was, I want to say 15. So I spent, you know, a whole year working on it, polishing it, doing the whole bit, uh, big audio system, you know, from, from back then. And uh, apparently I was a little too excited and didn't know how to drive. Uh, so that was my first day of driving. Oh well, first day gosh. of driving with a license. <laughs> what a story. That's crazy. Yeah. yeah. So that was, a, that was a bad move. Do you have anything? Okay, that was dumb. But do you have anything silly, maybe? <laughs> silly. I mean, who hasn't heated springs to lower their car back in the day, you know, when, when you either couldn't afford it or no. they didn't have stuff? Nadine so, can one-up uh, that one. I can one-up you. What did you do? I cut my springs in half. Wait. <laughs> like the stock springs. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> half? <laughs> <laughs> I did. Oh my gosh. If you guys want to hear that story, that is in our intro episode and it's hilarious because Benson asks me and Mark and like Benson said I won for the stupidest thing. So <laughs> it's for my 240, Nick. It's for my 240. Oh. Well, you know. I'm sure you can get a you know suspension sponsor at this point. You yeah. Know, support the yeah, yeah. support the podcast. <laughs> get this poor woman some springs. <laughs> poor woman. <laughs> oh my gosh. So uh since we're talking about your early years, Nick, um, can you tell us what was your involvement with cars before you got your job with Falcon? Cars is really all I've ever known and uh and all i've ever really been interested in you know even as a young kid uh that's always been my thing you know if i wasn't riding my bmx and freestyle bikes when i was uh, before i could drive i was thinking about cars and yeah. that's you know I, I think i could probably blame my cousin when i was seven years old we were living back in uh in greece so my cousin's a, a rally driver and he took Ooh. me for a spin around athens and his old Datsun. And that's, you know, at seven years old, that really kind of sticks out in my mind. Like yeah. that was cool, you know, just, uh, you know, hauling, you know, what around town in this cool car with your older cousin. And I think that's when I officially got the bug, but yeah, I mean, that's, that's kind of like what I've always done, you know, uh, like cars have just kind of always been there for me. Um, you know, whatever I could do to be around cars, whether it was a job, you know, when I was, senior year in high school, I was working at an oil change place just to be around cars yeah. uh, and make some money. Yep. Uh, and coincidentally, that's that's kind of where I discovered the uh, the import scene because one of my coworkers, one day he was like, hey, me and a buddy of mine, we're going to go out to uh, the runs on Saturday night. You want to go? I'm like, what are you talking about? This is early 90s San mm -hmm. Diego. And it was just mind blowing yeah, at the time, just going out there and seeing hundreds and hundreds of cars uh, lined up at doing the street stuff races. At, at the street races. Yep. And, you know, that only took once to get the bug. And then from there it was like, okay, how much top ramen do I need to eat to, <laughs> uh, to buy an Integra and just do this. And, yes. and that's what I ended up doing. I was, you know, changing oil and, and saving money and, uh, just trying to modify my car. So before we met, I didn't know this at the time that we met, but, uh, you were big into, uh, the car show scene. 
right? Down in San Diego. Yeah. And yeah. Yep. You were with a team. Um, what kind of car did you have? You know, can you tell us about that? Yeah. Yeah. It was uh, me and a bunch of high school friends, a close buddy of mine, Mark. We uh, started this car club down in San Diego, Team Explicit. And um, really just a, a group of guys. Uh, and we loved modifying our cars. It was all import cars. Uh, I had a 94 GSR. But we had everything, Civics, Eclipses, Del Souls, uh, all that stuff. And, uh, you know, we did a lot of the car shows in, in the area. And we went out and, you know, did some of the late night racing, but, you know, never claimed to be, you know, the fastest street team out there or anything like that. But we went out and had some fun. That's actually the, the same car club where I met Selena, uh, my wife, who, you know, it, you know, the routine, you, you find someone that's uh, equally as crazy about what you love to do. And yep. it just makes life a little bit easier. Right. Oh, yeah. So, so we um, know all about that. <laughs> so yeah. Was she in that car scene, too? Yeah, she was actually in the car club. You know, when, oh. I, when I first oh. when I first met her, she had a uh, she's a girl racer. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. she, cool. Yep. So she had a, a little 91 CRX, you know, just jet black yellow old school little og sparko mesh wheels and an yep. auto power roll cage and i was like all right that's uh that's the one right there dang i didn't even have a cage nope what's up wow that's that's a yeah. oh that's so cool that's awesome. i love that story but yeah and then from there it was uh you know doing like you said a lot of uh ken shows import show off you know the yep. original yep. um shout out yeah ken you know the og he does not get enough credit uh, for what he did, but no. uh, hopefully you get him on a future show. Yeah, I did speak with him, and uh, he's not ready for that right now. Um, but I think we have to pull him in. So Nick, I'll need your help with that. Absolutely, no, I'd be happy to. Okay, yeah. Ken, we're gonna look for you. Yeah, everyone who knows Ken Miyoshi that's listening to this podcast, please reach out to him <laughs> and tell him to start doing interviews again. Before we all get too old. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> we got to put it on wax, Ken. Yeah. Oh. So Nick, how did you get into drifting? I mean, I think with uh, a lot of people in North America, it was just through the option magazines, the option videos, and kind of finding, you know, the cars that were going sideways. And I'm going, whoa, wait a minute, what, what's all this? And, you know, I was a Honda guy uh, at the time, but, you know, watching these rear wheel drive cars just, you know, flying around the corner going sideways was just like, it's, it's amazing. Uh, so, you know, I followed it through the magazines and videos, you know, I was like, uh, you know, one of probably a handful of, you know, the token white guys at the Johan market, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, in uh, yes. Mira Mesa over there looking through the magazines and, you know, <laughs> not being able to read a word, but, you know, that's what Japanese friends were for and you can get them to read it and order parts and so forth. But yeah, really it was, it was from there and, uh, as silly as it may sound you know of course that that, that little anime that was popular back then too yep, you know initial watching, seeing that yep. initial d and i was like ah, oh, this is a cool thing you know and it was uh it had really i mean i i know that it was being done here uh before i started you know getting involved or even seeing it but it, it never really hit the mainstream um but yeah that's that's where i got my introduction to drifting that's cool so let's jump ahead a little bit to your job at Falcon. So you were heavy into the car show scene and street racing and stuff like that. Um, can you tell us how did that happen for you? It was a uh, great timing, <laughs> very lucky and uh, being persistent. Uh, honestly, I was a sponsored guy by Falcon. Uh, they were using a couple of uh, mine and Selena's cars for photo shoots and display at SEMA and you know, international auto salon and stuff like that. So it was uh, one of those things where I kind of had my foot in the door by being in their presence. So I just kept asking for a job and asking for a job. And I think it, it took me six months and they finally gave in and they, uh, they said, Hey, yeah, we've got this uh, entry level marketing position. Uh, would you be interested? And, and I jumped on it and uh, you know, it's kind of one of those things where you leave the interview and, and you just feel determined like, you know, I need to do this. I yep. need to get this job. This is my shot. And, uh, and they gave me a shot. So you started at the bottom, literally. Yeah. I mean, uh, really it was, a, uh, you know, the marketing department was fairly small at the time. 
but I do need to give props to Jim Stoby, who gave me a shot and helped me get my foot in the door with the company. And of course, uh, Richard and Darren, uh, who are still there today as uh, president and VP, that they're the ones that hired me. Um, so to hire a kind of a punk kid <laughs> to come into your corporation and uh, really listen and uh, ask for advice on what to do, uh, that's really where the drifting concept came into play because it was the president. I said, Hey, let's do something different. Let's do something exciting that, that helps uh, put us on the map and, and get some recognition. I said, Hey, I've been watching this drifting stuff for a few years, just personally in my own passion. Yeah. Why don't we do that? Uh, and he kind of looked at me crazy and then he said, okay, let's do it. So I reached out to Falcon Japan and uh, connected with uh, Kaguchi and Sego and uh, uh, the rest is history, right? Oh my gosh. That conversation, I would have loved to be in the room at right, that time. Right. You make it sound so casual. <laughs> was it casual like that? Yeah, was it really that easy, Nick, to just convince the president? It, no. Uh, you know, <laughs> <laughs> it really wasn't. You know, uh, my director uh, at the time, Darren, he's the daring guy, right? He'll try anything and, you know, be the disruptor and do all those things. So when I came to him with these different ideas, he was all for it. Hey, you know, let's try it. If it doesn't work, uh, Richard, you know, being at the top, he's got the whole company on his shoulders. So it took a little bit of convincing, but between the two of us, it came to fruition and, uh, and it worked out. When you brought this up, what was Falcon concentrating on at the time? At the time, really, we were just a strictly uh, ultra high performance tire line company, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we, we only did pretty much just car tires and some sport truck tires. So they were really focusing on the car shows, which okay. was the big thing at the time. So that was, was huge then. Yeah. Yeah. So the import show offs, the hot import nights, the, uh, you know, all the other things that were happening. No P. Mm -hmm. So this didn't take the place of it, but it was uh, in addition to it because we continue to do shows and, and all kinds of things for, for many, many years uh, in addition to Drift. Right. So this was back in 2002, right? When you guys were talking 2003, something like yeah, that. Yeah. Yeah. I started with the company in October, 2002. And it was a, it was a pretty quick turnaround to get everything going by our first drift show off, which was March, 2003. So it Jeez. was, was really fast. You know, wow. Got in through the idea out there and it got picked up and then we just went for it. You didn't have people that were in the company saying like, who's this new guy coming in here and trying to change everything? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it was so small at the time. Falcon was, you know, you can walk down the hallway and wave to everyone, okay. you know, within a couple hundred yards. Uh, now it's a lot different, you know, he, with uh, several floors of people and, and all yeah. that. So it was really a welcome thing, you know, and that's one thing that the culture of the company has always been really open and family. And mm -hmm. um, even today that we've grown to the size that we are, um, everyone knows that it's for the greater good and everyone works and kind of tries to row in the same direction mm -hmm. for our continued growth. So leave the egos at the door and come in and just do what's right. I that's mean, awesome. that's definitely where I learned that from. And I preach that to my team every day, you know, and I, and I ask them, Hey, what can I do better? Right. Nobody has all the answers. And it may be the newest guy that walked in the door. That's going to have the greatest thing and give credit where it's due and give the younger people, team members, guys and gals, uh, opportunity to really get their shine. That's great. Just like that, I kicked off Drift Show Off. <laughs> I know, I know. Tell us about Drift Show Off and how that came about, because Ken Miyoshi, he's the king of import show off. Tell us about how you got involved with Drift Show Off. Yeah, so um, when... Like I said, it, it was a very short timeline to try to turn this thing around and, and get the event going. So when I started doing research online of, you know, what are the organizations that are doing this in Southern California that can help us put something like this together quickly, who pops up first? Club 4AG, right? So right. start, you know, sending emails out to those guys. And yep. Shout out to Moto and Naoki. Absolutely. You know, and at first I reached out to them and I don't know if they thought it was a spam email or what but they were just kind of like i don't think we're the right people for this but there's this guy that's looking to do uh you know this events potentially 
And uh, funny enough, it was them that connected me with Ken, which I knew, you know, very loosely just from the car show days. But they said, you know, Ken's the guy to do this and then we can do the operation side of it. So it was really, you know, Ken bringing his expertise and bringing the show to the show and then uh, Moto and Naoki doing what they've been doing for years already. And then us with the backing and the advertising and, uh, you know, bringing the, our team from Japan. And that's how it kind of came together. Wow. And the rest is history. Jeez. That's kind of like a, a beautiful union right there. Very historic union. Right. And you all <laughs> played very important parts, right? It wouldn't have happened without all of your efforts. So for those listeners who aren't familiar with Drift Show Off, um, Option Video has come in the past a couple times before Drift Show Off happened. And, you know, they came over, they did their video thing. But really, that's what it was, is it was for their video content, right? So they didn't try and promote it to the masses to, you know, come watch this happen in front of your eyes. They just wanted it on camera. So they were inviting people in terms of drivers and, you know, whatever pit crew that came with you. But that was it. Drift Show Off was kind of the first event where... With Ken Miyoshi's help, you know, with his ability to publicize his car shows that he's done in the past, he really got the word out there that this was happening and that we were going to have drift drivers from Japan um, on U.S. soil drifting and doing demos, as well as having a competition with American drivers. And um, that was the first time that that had ever happened. And so there was a mix of, you know, there was a car show there going on. There were tons of spectators because Ken Miyoshi knew how to bring the spectators with his car shows, right? So he did that for the drift event. And um, that was like the first major uh, U.S. drift event. Koguchi was there and Sego Yamamoto was there as well as, um, Reese you know, Millen. Yeah, re, that was that was <laughs> the right. first time us drift guys saw Reese Millen. In, in an all-wheel in, drive. Yeah, that's what, in his race car. He brought his race car. Yeah. So for me as the winner of that event, that really changed my life. Um, it reinforced to me that I could do something with what I was doing on the track and that I could, you know, strive for bigger things. And it put me in touch with a lot of people that I have relationships with today. And it changed the culture of drifting in the U.S. Uh, because, you know, now we were competing on a larger level. It wasn't just these small events it really was like the kickoff of the it, wave. It know? really was. It really was. It was big time. I know, Nick, that you're a very humble guy, but I just need to express to everyone that's listening how big of a deal that this event that you put on. Thank you. Yeah, it's, yeah, I'm I'm a humble guy and that's, uh, that's definitely true. And again, it was just uh, a little idea that I brought to the table, but there was just so many people that made it all happen. You know, the, the everyone that we mentioned already from Ken, Naoki, Moto to, you know, getting the blessing from the bosses to be able to make it happen. But also the staff, you know, the mm -hmm. motorsports and event staff of our company early on, you know, Roman, Mickey, Kelvin, it was, there were no teal and blue motorsports rigs. It was, right. you know, <laughs> it was a Chevy Dually and a very long trailer that right. literally the four or five of us would drive across the country. You know, right. there were no truck drivers. So right. we were just kind of out there doing it. And then that's one thing that I definitely want to give a shout out to and, and thank from the early team members that I had all throughout the years to the guys that are still doing it now, you know, Jonathan Bradford, Steve, mm -hmm. uh, the, the whole crew, you know, uh, Gerald, all the guys, you know, the truck drivers, everyone. So we're all just a, a cog in the wheel, right? Like it can't happen unless everyone's pulling together and doing their part. So I won't jump in front and say, hey, look at what I did. I may have started a little spark within our company to do it, but uh, it's been a lot of people that kept it going now for uh, 18 years. Yeah, definitely. Of course, we wouldn't be able to do it without tons of support. But the ripple effect, I would say, started from you. But I'm going to change the subject right now so that you can't divert the props that I'm giving you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so um, I was talking to Steve, and uh, he mentioned um, a story about Koguchi. Um, Who's Steve? You... Tell us. Oh, Steve Wong. <laughs> Steve Wong, who works at Falcon. He still works there to this day. 
And he was telling me about a Koguchi story in the parking lot. Oh. Can you fill us in on that story? <laughs> yeah. So the Koguchi story in the parking lot, that was my first in-person viewing experience of, of drifting. So we had just gotten the containers in from Japan, uh, the first cars for drift show off. This red car. Yep. His red car and Sego's uh, chaser. So we're unloading these cars and uh, we had our top boss who oversaw everything at our company, Mr. Honda, who was just a unbelievably kind and humble, great Japanese man. And, and you knew he carried his weight, but he'd go around every morning and say hello to every single person in the building. But you also knew like when he said something had to get done, like you got it done. Right. So we're unloading these, uh, these cars out of the trailer. It's myself, a few of the guys, Mr. Honda. And jokingly, I said, oh, we should do a demo in the parking lot to Mr. Honda. And then he, <laughs> he looks over at Koguchi and he gives him like this nod. And I'm going, oh boy. Uh, <laughs> so Koguchi gets in the car and just proceeds to completely fill the parking lot with smoke. He was drifting in between tire <laughs> containers, around employee cars. It was just, it was insane. I can't remember exactly how long it went for, but it was long enough where there was enough smoke in the area that the police showed up. Oh, no. And they're like, what is going on here? And Mr. Honda, you know, he, he comes out of the pack of people and he says, we're doing tire testing. And the cops <laughs> turn around and they left. <laughs> nice. <laughs> And so this is not at the event. This is at Falcon Tires Corporate, right? In exactly. Yeah, that was uh, wow. that's the old parking lot story. So um, it's tire Nick, testing. Nick, we we interviewed Ken Gushi last for the last episode, and he got into so much trouble, quote unquote, testing. I really wish that you guys were around. Mr. Honda was around <laughs> to help him because he's just. He got into so much trouble. Ken, Ken would never get away with testing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But Honda San did. That's, that's nice. Lucky. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> and Steve made sure to mention to me that Koguchi was uh, smoking a cigarette the whole time. Yeah, Koguchi always had a cigarette hanging out of his mouth. I mean, he, he'd be, you know, mid-drift cigarette hanging out, yeah. you know, <laughs> waving out the window, <laughs> driving with his knee, uh, you know, with the door open. But... <laughs> You know, that's what you did. Did you get a ride that day? I did. Yeah, that was my first ride as well. Okay, um, can you tell us about that experience? Was it as magical as it was for you as my first drifting experience? Uh, yeah, I, it was, you know, you're watching this stuff on videos for years. And then all of a sudden, you know, there's this guy, you know, that you've watched this drifting video over and over and over again. And you know, here he is. He's yeah. just going to, you know, put you in the car and, and take you for a spin around the, you know, the parking lot there. It was a, a definitely memorable one. Is it what you thought it would be like? It wasn't slow motion 3D, yeah. like what yours was, <laughs> but pretty close. Yeah, that's crazy. Nick, you were blessed by the drifting god Koguchi. I hope you realize that that is a very rare experience. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> he really is like a rock star, huh? Oh, yeah. He is. Yeah. I uh, mean, Ken, a legend. Ken kind of painted a different picture of him to us. He was just like this normal guy. But anytime we saw him he was smoking a cigarette and he was like he Ooh, always looked super yes, cool yes yeah and nick you're so lucky because you know all of our our first drifting experiences were like with amateurs with american me. amateurs <laughs> like mine was with benson right i just got benson like in the mountains like trying to do yeah. donuts and like you get koguchi to give you your first drifting experience i'm so jealous nick yeah, yeah, it was, uh, you know, crazy. <laughs> <laughs> and now let's take some time out for this episode's sponsor. Lucky Labo is a specialty retailer of authentic JDM goods with a focus on skylines and Sylvia's. They coin their offerings as vintage, authentic, and quirky items that highlight and show the love for the history of these cars. Lucky Labo's roots run back to 2006 when founder Bill Tomlin bought his first 240SX. 
Lucky Labo curates a unique product line of JDM accessory essentials that we've grown to love. My personal two favorite items that Lucky Labo has to offer on their website are their Wolf Clan Garage Driving Clubs in Wolf Gray. These gloves are made of leather and a knit fire retardant fabric. Gotta love them. And my second fave would be the Carmate Psy Angel Air Freshener G811. It's a white cube air freshener that's flanked with magenta hearts all over it. Oh my gosh, you had me at hearts. And it also has a fairy musk scent. Super adorable. Lucky Labo has generously donated two giveaway packs for our Instagram giveaway. We'll be announcing that giveaway on our Instagram just a few days after this episode drops. I am so excited to share that with you. Make sure to check out Lucky Labo on IG at lucky.labo and their website at lucky-labo.com. And now let's get back to the grilling. So Nick, can you talk about the Falcon colors? A lot of the Falcon drivers were running the Falcon scallop paint scheme on their cars. But at a certain point, it changed to the teal and blue that we're used to seeing today. Can you talk about why you made that change and how did that happen? Well, the first uh, pair of cars that we did, Koguchi's and Sego's, our first U.S. cars that we put together specifically here, was uh, just a silver and blue scheme that Really, we just came up with here at our office. It wasn't like an official thing. When we went to the teal and blue, we basically adopted that from global efforts. So what was being raced both in Japan on like a Porsche racing program at the head going there and also in, uh, in Germany, at the Nürburgring racing where they were you know, running Skylines and a lot of other cars at the 24 hour race. So at the time, you know, drifting was just, becoming its own and it was a let's do it and ask for forgiveness later (laughs) uh, sort of thing because it was very much guarded you know the teal and blue was Ah. for traditional start finish you know flag to flag type of racing got it and uh was what was another one of those things where we just said hey let's just do it and see what happens but again nobody complained and and it was a good thing and you know I'm, i'm glad we did it because while you know, teal and blue has been around for a really long time. I, I think what we did here with all the cars that we've done over the years that were, you know, the scallop teal and blue, it's kind of become kind of like the golden arches for Falcon in a way where, you know, you can see that livery and yep. not even have a logo on the car and you can you know exactly what it is. Very iconic. Yeah. I mean, not quite as good as McDonald's, but you know, for <laughs> the people that are in our world, it's recognizable. So I always get a kick seeing, you know, whether it's a, road and track or motor trend or some of the other ones where they'll say, Oh, you know, what's the top 20 iconic, uh, motorsports liveries. And yeah. we're in the mix with some legends like the Gulf livery and yeah. martini and some of the other ones I'm going, wow, you know, that's pretty cool. You know, and it, again, it was a global effort and, you know, be- Drifting was a large part of it as well, but, uh, you know, our TUSC IMSA program and, and everything that we did to promote that and they still run it even today in Europe as well. And I was at Target, Nick, and I bought a Hot Wheel and it's yeah. got the teal and blue. Yeah. <laughs> no, we, we've always done a good job of working with a lot of partners, you know, and, and again, getting people, you know, getting the kids excited about just cars. It's in all of our best interest, right? Yep, that's right. That's the future. That's the future. And, uh, you know, from a company standpoint, hey, let's put our colors in front of them and they'll remember it when they get older, right? So we work with tons of toy companies. We yeah. work closely with Hot Wheels. We do other die casts. We do RC cars. We've, we've done so much with video games over right. over the years, right? Like Gran Turismo and everything else, you know, after that. So yeah, it, it's important. Yeah, definitely. And if you're not on golf livery status now, you will be you know, when our kids are, are older. Yeah. I love it. And Nick, another thing that you guys have been big in for the last 18 years is supporting formula drift, the first pro American drift series. So, I mean, talk to us about that because I can't believe you guys have been involved with formula D for 18 years. I, that's just hard to believe for me. So, so tell us how did that all come about? And how have you stuck with them for 18 years? 
Yeah, I mean, they're, they're, they do a great job. You know, Jim and Ryan over there, they were at the right place at the right time. And as many people know, they were the ones that, uh, you know, helped the early D1 efforts happen you know, when they first came to the States through their Slipstream company. And then they branched off and they did their own thing as a dedicated US series. And while we were doing Drift Show Off, and we were perfectly happy doing that with Ken, and it was a uh, an exhibition for us, right? We were able to bring in the pro guys from Japan and, and, and really kind of spread the word of drifting and show them uh, what, what the drivers from Japan can do. Uh, and then also at the same time, do the you know, more amateur level type of competitions and everything at our events where Formula D came in. And while in, in many cases, it, there were the similar drivers at first, they were doing, you know, a, a point series, they were going to, you know, multiple states, and they were building out a schedule. So it just made sense. You know, we jumped in both feet into drifting. And uh, of course, we needed to support the premier US series. So uh, yeah, that's something that we're really proud of is, uh, you know, supporting them since literally day one, and they're still doing it today and definitely having their own challenges, especially after a year like we had last year, you know, uh, kudos to Jim and Ryan for keeping that series together through a, a year, you know, dealing with everything with COVID and those things. So they did a really great job keeping the series whole, keeping the schedule, you know, as whole as they could and delivering exposure and, and giving people something to watch when we were all kind of locked down. Yeah, um, definitely. So yeah, uh, great great group over there as well. But I, I ask the heavy hitting questions sometimes, the controversial questions, Nick. So, Oh boy, you're in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> I have to ask one every episode. So like I, I was thinking about it and, you know, being a sponsor for so long, I, I mean, there's got to be other tire companies that are supporting them or maybe the drivers are, I mean, what kind of conflicts or challenges have come up in the last like 18 years. Like, cause I, I feel like it's not that easy to, to stay with them for that long and have other manufacturers kind of competing with you to sponsor or you sponsoring while some other drivers are on different tires or like, I, I don't know. I, I can't imagine what the challenges would be, but can you like give us some insider info? Uh, <laughs> Honestly, I, I think over the years, probably early on, everyone was a little bit more defensive or protective of, oh, this is our thing or, the, you know, whatever, us included, you know, because we did invest so much into it and other people did as well. But for the most part, I think the tire companies, we all play well together. We all understand that th there's enough room for everyone. There's so many tire brands and there's so many people that Fortunately for us, they need tires, you know, not just for drifting or not just for sport, but, you know, to get the work, to get the school. Yeah. So, of course, there's always competition there. And we're always looking to, you know, do a little poke to the other guy and, and <laughs> you know, get a jab in here and there. But at the end of the day, we're all just, uh, you know, trying to sell some product and promote our companies. So, but yeah, I would say earlier on when all of us were a little bit younger and maybe a little bit more aggressive. There was a more, you know, defensive type of feeling between brands. But now I see folks from other tire brands and, you know, it's like, okay, well, we're going to get you this weekend, but that's about it. <laughs> Nick, I remember um, when we first met you and I, I was never sponsored by Falcon, but you are always really nice to me and you're always really professional. And even though you say that uh, you're a little defensive in those early days, I never felt that from you. Yeah. You know, it's life's too short, you know, at the end of the day, we're, yeah. you know, we all got to get along together and we're all doing these things because we love cars, you right. know, we, we love this industry and we want to help grow it. So it's fighting each other. doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Right. So, you know, you, you work with the people. I mean, look at all the people that we work with over the years, yeah. you know, and you talk about some of the earliest pro level drivers at some point they were with our team, right. you know, and for, various reasons, you know, whether it be from their personal side or whether it be from our side or yeah. the necessity to have to, you know, reduce the number of drivers or, or whatever, or for them to have other opportunities, you know, of course there have been some hard feelings, you yeah. know, I, I'd be lying to you if, if there wasn't because you grow bonds with people and you back them. And sometimes you, you just can't 
offer them what they need to help them get to their next place. So I'd lie if I said that no one ever left and I felt kind of, you know, slighted or anything. Right. But now being a little bit older, I completely understand. Got some perspective. Yeah. Yeah. And I respect them for it and I'm happy for them, you know, uh, because you want to see your friends succeed. Right. Right. Yeah. I think what you're talking about is passion, right? Um, Especially when we're young and we're all experiencing something new to everybody and, and we all have our own skin in the game, right? You have to have some passion. And there's an interesting story that I haven't thought about in a while, but before Formula D started, I don't know if you remember this, Nick, but Slipstream was telling us we're going to launch this new series, this pro series, and we want to get all of you guys to buy in, right? And while they were doing that, there was another group of guys trying to do a, a pro series, and they were trying to do the same thing. They wanted to get all the best drivers and get them to say, I'm going to run your whole series this season, right? It was, uh, the other one was, I think it was called XDC. Is that right? Yeah, I remember uh, that. Do you remember that, Nick? Yeah, I do remember that. So yeah. an interesting observation that I have is that we would hold these meetings, all the drivers, we would sit down and say, okay, let's talk about the pros and cons of these guys. You know, w- we have power in numbers, right? Because we're the talent. And so let's talk about who we want to support, you know, who we're going to commit to. And I'll tell you, it was all drivers plus members of your Falcon team. And there were no other tire manufacturers with people that felt like they had their skin in the game or they felt like they were passionate enough to be there even though they weren't drivers. Yeah. Yeah, and at that point, it could have gone either way, right? If we all said we were going to do XDC, we would be in a different place right now. Mm. Yeah. Um, Yeah. Yeah, that's one thing that drifting, because we were all getting into it at a at a special time, right? In North America, it was just growing. And to be part of anything that's like that is just such a experience, right? Yeah. In, in life to, to be part of something that just started to grow and then you just watch it kind of evolve over time. And it's been really cool. You know, there, there's been a lot of people that have made great careers out of it and continue yeah. to make great careers out of it. And some people have gone off and done other things. Some people are stunt drivers that started, you know, <laughs> right. from drifting and, right. and Look at JR, you know, he, he's got cars on, on four dealerships now with his name on them. You yeah. know? It's, it's like, who would have thought, you know, uh, and dreamt it. But for the people that have really stuck with it and gone all in, you know, and bet the farm, right. Yeah. And, and they've won. <laughs> yeah. um, that's awesome. So it's, it's really exciting. When you were starting at Falcon and you had this idea of pitching drifting to Falcon, did you have any idea it would be as big as it is today? It felt special, right? Did you know that it was going to be this big? I don't know. Uh, But it made you feel something different. You know, it was that, like we've always said, it's the most exciting part of a race, right? It's when they, they're on the brink of losing it, but then they control it. And that's what everyone wants to see. And that's what it was lap after lap after lap. So you knew that it was like, okay, this is something different, but you know, to have it in every single car manufacturers commercial now like right. when do you not see you know you, you've got every year making model car now and every commercial is drifting yep. you know and there you go there's reese again right. Right. Uh, yeah. so <laughs> <laughs> yeah and drifting and commercials have changed a little bit right because before they were a little power slidey like um in in early movies and the, the way they portray drifting now is totally different yeah yeah. yeah, like even the newest BMW commercial that was just yeah. on, uh, it's like, okay, there they go again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> just because it's cool. Yeah. So you've brought over many iconic cars from Japan running Falcon Colors. And they don't always go back to Japan, right? I've heard some stories about some of these iconic cars being crushed. Yeah. Yeah. Unfortunately, (laughs) in the early days, and because we're a corporation, it just gets very complex. And the rules, you know, back in early 2000s of bringing cars over, you know, you basically get them over here on a short term visa. And then you have the option of, okay, do you 
get it here, turn around, send it back to send it back again. And then you're, yep. you're shipping cars, you know, across the ocean right. several times. So yeah, unfortunately some of the early cars and I can't remember exactly which one did or didn't to be completely honest, it's been so long, but yeah, we I only we know had... two. Um, oh, you know. I was wondering if there are more. <laughs> okay. Well tell us the two. Cause I'm curious. So I know that Koguchi's teal and blue car got crushed. Yeah. And I know that Hatakayama's EF was crushed. Oh, correct. Yeah. How do you know that? Oh, I've I've got people on the inside. <laughs> <laughs> so Nick is like, you're not supposed to know that stuff, Benson. <laughs> the thing about Koguchi's car that I thought was funny and sad was I mean, Koguchi is the 180 god, right? And uh you know, anything he touches, people want it. He had his hood on the car, that that famous Koguchi Power hood. <laughs> and I know that when uh, several of your employees, Nick, found out that the car was going to be crushed, people were wanted to claim the parts <laughs> because they knew it was going to get crushed and they were not allowed to claim any of the parts. Yeah, and so, yeah that, that, was, that was the thing. You know, they had to be basically destroyed in the same exact way with the exact same parts that were yeah. brought over. But the only thing that even remotely makes you feel better about the whole thing was that car was specifically made for us. So it wasn't like right. his the legendary, you know, right. his personal car or anything. Right, right. So they, they were, you know, both, both cars that were sent over from uh, uh, Kaguchi and Sego, they were built and they were paid for, you know, we paid them a fair rate, basically whatever they needed. Right. Um, so they built a car, sent it over, drove it. They got paid to drive it here. And then when we had to, you know, make it right with customs, because yep. it's either you play nice with customs or then all of a sudden your tires don't start showing up. Uh, <laughs> and that, that would have ended drifting for us a long right. time ago. So right. we had to play by the rules. Yeah. You put his car in the crusher. Did you see like the Sonic the Hedgehog move where, you know, he dies and then all the gold coins start flying out? <laughs> <laughs> no, no. They just, uh, we left to go in the parking lot. We're just like, here, take it. You know, oh. I don't want to I, I see. Uh, I kind of see it as a missed opportunity. You could have like a drift show off where you just Koguchi sends it straight into a K rail off of this. <laughs> no, You're gonna crush it. Let's make it worth watching. More you know? epic. Right. Oh, I wonder oh if it really gosh. did get crushed though, because those junkyard guys have been like. Oh yeah. Did, do you have video evidence? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's just gonna show up one day. Like, hey, look what I got, guys. <laughs> Salvage title. <laughs> I see. Okay. Well, well, Nick, I want to talk about Nick. This is a lot about Falcon, Nick, but you know what? I want to talk to you about your current projects. And because I stalk you, I mean, I follow, okay, I follow you on Instagram and I, I see your really cool pictures and stories. And I know that you were recently at, is it Button Willow with your FD? And I mean, you've got your own little car collection going on. And, you know, I love FDs and you have two which is not fair because I don't even have one yet. I mean, tell us about your, your current car projects going on right now. Yeah, I've got, uh, you know, the two FDs, um, the one that I'm taking it to track days and so forth. I, I picked that one up about five years ago. The first FD was actually Selena's project car. And that one we've had for 22, 23 years. Wow. And that one... That was the car that was built um, and was being used by Falcon uh, primarily for their advertising and SEMA and all that. So that one, I feel like that got my foot in the door and we just, we can never get rid of that because then yep. that would be some bad luck omen or something, right? <laughs> um, so just bury me in that one. And, and and really that one was kind of built more of a show car. So, you know, me and, and all the guys at work, you know, probably about five, six years ago, we, uh, we all kind of looked at each other like, you know what, we've we've been around a million different tracks between the drifting and IMSA and the Porsche program, and we're not getting any younger. Like if we don't go out there and, and have some fun for ourselves and, and get into a car and, and do some driving, we're going to regret it. Yeah. Um, so we, we all, you know, a number of us made a conscious effort and just said, you know, whether it's cars that we have now or, or something that we're going to build, let's go out and have some fun. Yeah. And, um, 
and we've been doing it, you know, myself and Jonathan and Steve and a couple of the other guys going out and just doing fun track days and going out doing Optima competitions, you know, trying to just get out there and, and enjoy it. Cause you know, at the end of the day, they're, they're really meant to be driven. So I, I won't do that to the first FD. Uh, and that one's still kind of the trophy piece in the garage, but yeah. I'm having fun with the, uh, now the green, uh, the green FD and my MR2, just going out and driving them. What's different about doing it now compared to the nineties when you're doing it then? For me, not much. Cause <laughs> I'm kind of doing everything retro style. So yeah. not to be super strict period, correct. But, you know, for me, it's kind of that nostalgia, right. Of, you know, what were the things that I was looking at in the mm-hmm. option magazines when I was buying them in 99 or 2000 or whatever. And it was, you know, the old RE kits and yeah, you can go out and, and buy all the new stuff and it looks really cool and it works and, and everything. But I find putting my own projects together. It's fun to make it kind of like a scavenger hunt where, oh, yeah. you know, you find stuff on offer up, you get stuff off of eBay, you know, like uh, my green car. I'm happy to finally get it all together with all kind of the first style uh, Ari Amimea mm-hmm. arrow. And it's been completely pieced together from all like the mirrors I got off eBay, some guy in Russia that was selling them the, right. Hood was, you know, imported from Florida off a car that got brought over. Great uh, hood. I love that hood. Yeah. You know, and they're kind of hard to find. Most of the stuff was in pretty ragged shape, but, you know, luckily I, I worked at a body shop for a long time. You know, I, I can get down with fiberglass if I have to, I, <laughs> I'll be itchy for a week, but you know, I haven't lost it yet. So you know, I, I, I like getting my hands dirty and like doing as much of the work as I can myself. Um, so it's fun. Yeah, I love the mirrors on your your green FD. I was kind of checking it out on Instagram. I usually look at a car and I, I pick my favorite part. My favorite part are your mirrors, for sure. <laughs> yeah, they're not very functional because they're made for right-hand drive. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. really what I need to do is have uh, new mirrors cut with the yeah. shape, you know, the the concave the right direction yep. so they, they work. Yep. But I haven't done that yet. So instead, I just... Uh, I 3D printed some wedges to kind of change the angle of the glass, oh, and nice. it's a, uh, it's getting me by. Wow! But 3D printing, yeah. you're so fancy. That's high tech. Jeez. No, uh, hey, it's either that or you know, start bending stuff out of metal. Or you do what I do, and you just pray, and you just change <laughs> lanes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, you just have someone in the front with you all the time. Nick's Nick's balling it here with a 3D printer. Sorry. Oh my god. Oh, come on, it's like it's 180 dollars on uh, Amazon. Yeah. I, I don't know, man. That's still pretty baller. I, I don't. I don't have time for 3D printing. Custom 3D printing. And you have a 13 year old daughter, just like we do. And um, what does your daughter think of what you're doing? Like with the, you know, mommy and daddy's cars and have you influenced her at all? She's, you know, for a while, we started going to K1 right when she was just tall enough to go. Uh, So she was karting for a while and we'd go there very, very regularly. So shout out to K1 for K1 speed. uh, Yeah. So that that was a a really fun time with her. She kind of lost interest in it. And now her real passion is just drawing. Mm. Art is her thing. I can't get her to put down her iPad with the drawing app on it mm-hmm. or a pencil and paper. So she doesn't have a lot of interest in cars right now. You know, maybe she'll get it back later and that would be great if she does. But if she doesn't, that's okay too. Cause you know, definitely what I want to encourage her to do is to do what she loves right. yeah. and she's got a talent, you know, she draws things where, you know, I could barely you know, make a stick figure and she's just making these drawings that are like anime yeah. style. Yeah. And like, I couldn't do that. So I think she's like low key kind of like, yeah, whatever, <laughs> but I could tell she kind of likes it. Or at least I tell that to myself. It'll always be there for her. Yeah. 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 yeah her, it sounds like our daughters need to hang out. Cause yeah, our daughter's like all about the, the anime same. and the drawing and not so much the cars right now, but Mm-hmm. I think they're always around it. So it's like, it's there just like it was. Yeah. I mean, that's how it was for me too. My dad was always watching F1 and leaving all the car magazines on the toilet, you know, just like it's always there in your life and it's influencing yeah. you, even though you don't know it's influencing you till later. So I see, I see. Well, tell us what does the future hold for Falcon and drifting, Nick? 
we're still in it. We're, we're doing it. You know, we're, we're working with our current team and, and the guys are great. So yeah, we, we don't have any plans to change as long as formula D is there and, and doing their thing, you know, we want to be there uh, supporting them the whole way, you know, it, they still sell out venues. I, I still believe that formula D whether you're a, a diehard drifting fan or not, you can go there and you can have a great time at a formula D event, just checking out the midway, looking at a bunch of cars, whatever, but it's still, I think the majority of younger car enthusiasts look to formula D as a form of entertainment. And it's a great opportunity for us to promote our brand. So as long as they're doing well, you know, we'll be there to support them. Nice. But what about you personally? Like what's next for you? Like, What are your outside plans? of, yeah. Outside of Falcon. Uh, outside of Falcon. Uh, there is no outside just, of Falcon. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, from a career standpoint, like I, I'm happy where I'm at. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm really happy with what I do. Uh, I've had opportunities to do other jobs, you know, throughout the years, whether it was product planning and development uh, for the company and helping develop new tires on the UHP side. Actually, the new tire that just came out, the new uh, Xenus RT660 was a project that I had started five years ago when I was the product planning manager oh, Wow! for that division. So that's rewarding. But for me, I'm kind of little impatient and product planning takes a long time. Mm. So you need to, you know, come up with the concept, show proof that you need it, do all the long hours of evaluating and spreadsheets and everything else, not to mention the late night calls with Japan. So, you know, it really is like a long drawn out process, yeah. but that one for me, that one's like really rewarding now, especially with everyone really happy with the tire. Uh, so it's kind of like I, help plant that seed. And then obviously I'm not in there making the tires happen or engineer it, but being that we're kind of back in the game and that category yeah. has been, uh, has been fun. Nice. Just to let you know, Benson and I are both uh, drift instructors. And if you ever want to bring your green FD out to the track and learn how to drift, <laughs> yeah, the invitation's yeah, Nick, open. Is, is you can there show any... Nick what his car is, can do. Is, no, oh I, my God. I don't, I'm, Please not don't. One of, I'm not one of those instructors. <laughs> <laughs> um, Nick, is there any drifting in your future? No, I mean, for, <gasps> for me, Nick. no, I mean, uh, the early drift day days, yeah. I had a 240 for a while, actually, uh, at a S13 hatch with little GP sports spoiler. I think I got the idea from your car, Nadine. I love your spoiler. <laughs> the, Shout uh, out GP the little sports. lip spoiler. Yes. Yeah. Um, so I had that DRFT kit on it. Uh, the old Sea West stuff. Uh, what color was I it? Never, what color was it? It was that? white. White. Yeah, it was all white. Did you drive drift day? Um, yeah, I did a oh. few drift days. Uh, but to be honest with you, it, it was, you know, especially in those times uh, and with our group being a lot smaller, we were literally never home. You know, yeah. there yeah. was no time for your own hobbies. Like yeah. I didn't build or do anything with my cars for eight, nine, 10 years. I didn't touch anything of my own because we were doing 40 events a year yep. and it was just nonstop back to back. You can talk to the guys, uh, talk to Moto, you know, talk to you know the, the yep. people that were just constantly gone. So it was very challenging to maintain a hobby of your own or uh, regular life, you know, cause you were always gone, but that's what had to happen at that time. And, you know, you just had to commit and, and suck it up and do it. But yeah, I did a handful of drift day events and I was not good at it. And then it was like, okay, you know, I'm too busy. And then when I finally got back around to wanting to get something going on track, uh, use a lot less tires going and trying yep. to grip. Yep. Uh, and, not wrong. and honestly, I, I like to keep you know, again, kind of my, the show car side of me, I like keeping my stuff nice and it's inevitable. You like to keep your arrow on your car. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, when you drift, you're, you're going to make a mistake mm. and you're going to crash and all that. And for me, that's like the most painful part. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I don't want to, I don't want to have to fix it because yeah. I know I'm going to wreck it. Right. I feel, so, I feel the uh, same, Nick. Cause like I'm, I come from drag racing and car shows. That was like my first experiences. And I built my 240 for, um, I was like, I'm going to do car shows and drifting. And it was like, <laughs> my car was always thrashed. 
because I, yeah. I want to go to the car show, but I was drifting, so I would come with like zip ties and then I'm like oh no Ken I'm entering the show and it's a drift car that's a show car so I should get credit because it's Mm -hmm. both and I don't know but like stop but really but I I feel I feel Nick's sentiments because like I I'm a grip driver too like I I really like grip driving and I I know I love drifting always see Benson he sucks at grip driving terrible but it's not that I can't (laughs) I still want to learn. I just, I never spent the time. But but I agree with Nick. Like, yeah, the grip driving, like, you everyone, don't thrash your car, man. I think everyone who drifts wants their car to look nice all the time. It's just. Yeah. Well, I think today, I feel like today's drivers that drive like final bout and yeah, stuff. I shouldn't say everyone. They're fancy. I, don't, I really think some people don't care, but. <laughs> I don't yeah, know. Yeah, that's one thing that we should maybe touch on is final bout. I mean, what they're bringing to the table. And yeah. And. We've been working with Ilya and the team over there for years now because they do bring back some of that nostalgia in the early days and the style of drifting from like where it came from. And, oh, yeah. and that's nothing against what's happened in Formula D. You know, that evolution has happened because it, it has had to because you need to be the fastest right. and the rowdiest and the most horsepower. And, you know, reading some things online is kind of funny where you know, 15 years ago, it's like, oh, you know, to be a, a, a pro level car, you need to have four or 500 horsepower. <laughs> yeah. no, it's, it's double that, you know, yeah. it, it's, it's funny reading that, but final about with what they do and just the style that they bring and the cars just look, you know, the fitment's perfect. The cars look nice. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, they're slammed. And, and I just love that. Cause it reminds me again of like the old school, option type of builds from right. you know 2000 right. and uh and it looks great aren't we so lucky nick because this was the stuff that we fell in love with in the 90s right and how lucky are we that drifting has progressed and style has changed and with people like final bout they're bringing that stuff that we fell in love with originally back you know like 15 years later i mean what are the chances of that happening yeah. I remember when we we're walking in the pits, like um, for my first final bout uh, where we were judging and, you know, you go the day before and everyone's got their cars there and they're unloading them off the trailers and, and people are driving from like Canada to Wisconsin for the event or California to Wisconsin. And these are all like, you know, amateur, non-sponsored back drivers. And I, I love that. And then, of course, I love the style and it was just like a time warp when we we're walking down the pits area. Right. And it it's great. not only a it's not only a time warp in terms of the style that you're seeing, but it's grassroots, right? And it's a bunch of passionate people that are just gathering together because they love the culture. And it's a throwback in terms of what I felt like in those early days where, you know, we were all doing something new. In their case, it is, it's something new, even though it's a nod to something from the past. But I mean, um, the vibe that you're getting there is totally the same exact vibe that I had when, when we were doing drifting here and, and no one knew what it was. Yeah. So thank you for supporting Final Bout. <laughs> <laughs> Nick, awesome. Oh, shout out to Final Bout. Yep. Hey, guys. So, Nick, um, I know you're a humble guy, and I know that when when I reached out to you about doing this podcast, I asked you to fill some stuff out for me and help me get some information about your accomplishments and and how you've contributed to drifting culture and all of that. And you were pretty brief. And from me knowing you all these years, you're never one to brag. You're never one to put yourself on a pedestal or be the center of attention. So I had to do extra homework for your podcast. I know, Nick. I was going through your answers and you gave like one or two <laughs> lines. And, imp- you know, to compare when we had Slide Squad <laughs> give their answers. We got some essays. We got essays. <laughs> and then Nick comes with like two liners and I'm like, humble Nick. Yeah. Here we go. And, you know, that's totally fine. Right. And <laughs> I feel like someone like you deserves this amount of effort that I'm going to put into the podcast. So on your behalf, I reached out to some of the people that you've worked with 
Oh no. Stalker. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh no, it's right. No, these are all good. Don't worry. So I have two comments about that. Uh-oh. One, well, one, they're all great, right? But two, either you're like the perfect nice guy with a clean record. Or you've got these guys on lockdown or on payroll <laughs> or something because I got nothing juicy out of them. <laughs> so, no comment. Yeah. <laughs> uh-huh, okay. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. So, I'm going to tell you some of the things that people have said about you. I talked to Bradley Lim, who's an old friend of mine. And uh, he said he's grateful for all the things that you've done for him in his career as a tire professional. And I talked to Steve Wong, who said, you're very passionate about what you do and you lead by example and you'll give your shirt off of your back to anyone who needs it. And um, I talked to Jim Law from Formula D and Jim Law, he mentioned, you know, the difficulty that it must be for you to be a Formula D sponsor after all these years in terms of just your longtime partnership and conflict resolution. And, um, you know, he's mentioned that, you know, there's a lot of instances where um, you've had conflict because of judging calls or, you know, whatever that comes along with being a sponsor as well as a competitor. He didn't bring up that one time, did he? He, No, he didn't. Well, I I was trying to get that out of you earlier, Nick. (laughs) Yeah, I, I... You know, like you say, you know, we're all super passionate, Mm -hmm. especially with our own, you know, team members and everything. And there was one time that I probably uh, uh, lost my cool a little bit. It was the uh, the famous battle between uh, Sam Hubinet and Taka in Atlanta. Oh, Um, is that the first one? That was the one where they I swear they they must have reran like six times. That was that was the very (laughs) first Formula D. One yeah. more time. That was One David and uh, Goliath right there. And that was, uh, you know, it was like, wait, I, am I seeing this? And uh, yeah, we uh, we got all of our disagreements out at that one. And it's been good ever since. <laughs> but yeah, that one was that one wasn't good. Yeah, he did not mention that. And I, I'd also have to say, I've never seen you lose your cool. So that's pretty, <laughs> that's pretty cool. Um, it, it's rare. Yeah, it's rare. So, but Jim says that, and I'm quoting him here. He says, I always look back at those times and think that it could have broken our partnership, but I think there's a mutual respect, support, and working for a greater cause like promoting the sport and series. Yeah, well said. Yes. And then... There's more. There's more. I'm not done. <laughs> so uh, I talked to Dai, and uh, Dai says that Falcon has been supporting drifting since day one. And I believe that Nick is the biggest part of that. I really appreciate what he's done, not just for me personally, but for the community. And I talked to Calvin Wan, who says that Nick ran the initial drift program fully in-house with passion, like he was building his own cars with folks that all had the same passion. Jeez, Nick. And these are just, you know, the things that they said, but what they didn't say, or what I didn't mention that every single one of them said, including myself before I even talked to them, is that you were Drifting's biggest supporter since day one. And we really would not be here today if it weren't for you and your um, what you saw in Drifting in its future and the amount of support that you've given it. And so that's to also say that with some of the things that you've done, like Drift Show Off, you changed the course of my life. You gave me something that I felt like I could believe in myself and you gave me pro drifting to pursue. I feel like you've drastically changed drifting culture in the USA with Formula D as well as things like Just Drift and um, Final Bout, the, the grassroots stuff. And you've been so consistent over the last 18 years. We've seen tire companies support drifting and then pull back. And you guys have always been full steam ahead since the beginning. And you've always been the ultimate professional. Like I mentioned earlier, when we first met, uh, I wasn't running Falcon tires, but that didn't change anything between you and me. 
You've always been really great with me. You've always been supportive of me, no matter what tires I was running. You've helped us with the Drifting Pretty program on multiple occasions to empower women in motorsports. And you've just, you know, you've always made me feel like you're an old friend. And I really appreciate that. Oh, you guys are going to choke me up here. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you for all that. Yeah, thank you, Nick. I mean, it's really special to have you on. And I know a lot of people listening probably have never even been able to meet you. So thank you for letting us embarrass you today and put it out there. Thank you, guys. Yes. Yeah. And, and you know, I was telling Nadine when we were talking about having you on as a guest that this podcast exists to thank the unsung heroes. And there's a lot of pro drivers out there. Actually, all the pro drivers out there in the US, they know who you are, right? But everyone else may not. They see the Falcon colors and they see the Falcon drivers. They might be at an event and they'll see the Formula D, uh, the huge rigs out there with the, the DJs. And you know, you guys have such a presence at these events, but they might not realize where it came from. And so I wanna credit you for that. Um, even though you might not accept it, but but I do want to credit you and and thank you and put this in the cloud so that it will never go away so that, you know, your daughter can hear it and, you know, maybe your grandchildren someday and so forth. Thank you guys. Really? Yeah. yeah. You're welcome, Nick. And thank you so much for being on our show. And um, we won't embarrass you anymore. We'll close this out. But Nick, thanks so much for joining us and being our first really behind the scenes guest in this Lady Mania podcast. So guys, this closes out episode three and you guys can follow and stalk Nick on Instagram because that's where I do it. And that's at Nick Fusekis. That's F-O-U-S. E-K-I-S, and as well on Facebook. And guys, please follow us on Instagram at Saladymania and visit our website, podcast.saladymania.com. And you can watch this episode on YouTube as well. And you can get that link through our IG or our website. And please leave a message on our hotline. Leave us your questions or comments and tell us about the first time you fell in love with drifting. Leave your message or text to 323-607-6075, 323-607-6075. And guys, we'll see you in the next one. <laughs>